Hello, hello. Welcome to Oya Dimelo Cinema Club. Uh, I'm Michaela, and with me I have JP Ceruno at Don Del El Dalandino. That was really hard for my brain for two seconds. Whoa. And El Prof Professor. And today uh, we are going to be talking about the 1938-39M. I think it's 31. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> Early? No 19, way. It's 1931. No yeah, way. It is. Whoa. Well, anyways, with that impression still stuck in your brains, like, uh, let's just go through first impressions. <laughs> so I uh, have heard of this movie. I remember the cover of this movie, the hand with the M on it. Uh, I had never seen this movie and never really planned on seeing this movie. And then I read about it at one point and I, you know, I put it on a list. But when you brought it up, I was like, I definitely want to check this out. I thought it was going to be a Hitchcock style movie. I didn't realize it was as old as it was. And to be honest, the thing that caught me most, there's so many good things about this film. But the thing that caught me most is how dark and dreary they made. he made Germany in 1931, right around the time where Nazism is like going to come to full fruition in the third, like 33, 34. Um, and just how scary and dark everything is. And like, honestly... I felt like even the characters, physical features were kind of ugly. And, you know, like, I don't know if they used makeup on some of them. Um, he definitely, you know, created this dark, dark scene that was very cold. Everyone was wearing jackets the entire movie. It's very smoky. And there's a lot of backdoor deals happening throughout the movie. Um, I definitely think, I, like, he was definitely going for something. And he nailed it 100%. So for me, that was the thing that jumped out right away. My initial impression was how dark this film was and how cold it was. Hmm. OK, uh, either you two? I'll go. Um, ba -ba -da. First time watching, I guess, you know, I it's so close to the Hitchcock title was M Dial M for murder and some other stuff. So I didn't know at all what I was I was getting myself into and boy was I was I surprised. But yeah, it's terrifying. Just like I feel so, this is what I kind of like also of what we do watching these older movies at time. That then I can be like, oh, is this the first time they did this kind of shot? Is this the first time that they they tried this you know movement or this choice and stuff like that because we've seen it so many times like different thrillers different horror movies all that kind of stuff because there's some great camera work camera movement uh perspective stuff and yeah i i enjoyed the movie it was i don't know what i was expecting for but it was really dark and I, what I enjoyed was the the contrast uh, mm -hmm. between the 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 thief union and beggars union versus the police, and like kind of like you're also wondering like oh who's gonna catch him first who's gonna get the 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 serial rapist murderer first you know like is it gonna be the cops who are supposed to be the good guys or is it gonna be the thieves and robbers and beggars who who are just you know, so I like that a lot of just like the these subcultures that are, are you know, like it's fucking them up. Like not only the regular people, but the thieves are like, we can't do our job. Like ev everyone is on such high alert. We can't get away with what we normally get away with. So we need to find him and we need to neutralize him so things can go back to the status quo where we rob and steal and do whatever and the cops try to catch us so it's serial rapist murder out of here so yeah i enjoyed it it was very dark there's some great shots especially at the end where when the thieves spoiler do catch the the rapist and kind of put him on trial and there's some great like panning and camera changing angles and 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 you see him in front of basically all these thieves and robbers and probably also some murderers and they're all judging this one guy and may is this where it, the first idea of like kid you know rapists or whatever in jail or just in society is frowned upon more than anything else because i kind of think it is i don't know what what else where else that would be 
so yeah, that's uh, my first impression. QP? Uh, yeah, no, I mean, uh, M is not my favorite letter, so I'm going to dot a few <laughs> points regarding that. But this is actually not my first time watching this movie, but it, it's been so long that it kind of might as well have been. Because, uh, and I'm going to lie, while I'm watching this film, I couldn't help but think, like, wow, this, I'm remembering a heist movie that I watched with this film, and it's the same movie. Like, it literally becomes a heist movie near the second act. And, um, you know, kudos to any film that would use uh, Hall of the Mountain King as a bad guy song, which the last time I saw that happen was in The Musketeers, The Three Musketeers, <laughs> with Mickey, Donald, and Goofy. So that's pretty bomb. That's pretty BA. And, of course, how can you go wrong with Germany's favorite little crazy man, um, <laughs> Peter Lorre. I mean, you know, him, him and Albert Einstein coming into the States and just blessing us with their intelligence and their art. Mm -hmm. It's it's great. And uh, yeah, yeah, very, very great movie uh, for, for, a, for, for a movie called M. I think it's pretty A plus, you know, and our guy takes an L at the end. <laughs> Now you know your ABCs. So yeah, that's uh, my uh, initial thoughts, even though it's more like a secondary thoughts. Wow. Yeah, no, um, this is also my first time watching M. Um, it's something that's been on my list for like such a long time because I love that old like horror stuff to the point of ridiculousness. Like I thought it was one of those really amazing examples of when something changes in film because like the dark atmosphere matches a lot of like the German expressionism that was coming out like a couple decades before. Um, like it's very much in line with like Gollum and Nosferatu and like you can see that lineage there in the shadows in a way that's like really interesting. Um, and then like I also love how modern this film feels. Like that was like what surprised me the most this like watching it this first time is how modern like it, it just it felt like something that you could just like turn on today and like see this exact like plot and like i didn't at any time be like oh well that didn't age too well you know like there was never a moment like that for me in this film there's right. like a staccato to the german I mean, language in general that this film it really enhanced this film um they would repeat words over and over as well like when they're making a point and I think that really was important as well. I feel like it uh, kept an eeriness and like a, a tightness to all the language, you know, because it is a movie that we're watching in subtitles. But at the same time, you know, the, the language itself has just like a harshness to it when those guys were most of the people in the movie were speaking it. Um, that really kind of also resonated throughout the film and made like an extra like anxiety it was like an anxiety builder, I guess. Um, and I like that about it. I don't think if this movie was in English, it would have the same, you know, uh, depth. 100%. And, like, I also really, really thought that the use of, like, expositional shots in this was utilized in such a brilliant degree. Especially since, like, this was before, like, I feel like film itself was, like, the art form that we kind of recognize. Like, you can tell that someone put a lot of thought in the way that, like, this would tell like how the story would be told in images you know and, and you could tell that it was the start of the talkies because the sound design was awful i'm just kidding I'm just kidding I thought it wasn't that good. <laughs> no no we the, watched a pretty good version the the, the sound was good yeah i'm but, uh, I'm, I'm glad you brought the sound up and also just uh i guess when when you brought up the the whistling because yeah i that was so eerie just from the, you know at first you don't see who who the the villain is you just hear him whistling and and just how they they bring that back to the the blind guy you know recognizing who it is right and all just from the the hearing aspect of it and anytime you can get a song and make it creepy or evil and then the minute you hear that song it makes you like shiver is just like chef's kiss i mean this might be up there with singing in the rain with clockwork orange right 
There's also the Denzel Washington movie Fallen that uh, not as many people know, but I love it. I think it's uh, one of his underrated movies of him, you know, and he keeps, the devil keeps singing, um, uh, of course. Uh, 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 oh, time uh, is on my is side. On my side. Oh, yes, it is. Yeah. But yeah, so it, again, I'm like, because sound, how long was sound already being used, right? At that point in 31? Like, it wasn't, hadn't been 20 years, right? 10 years, even maybe 31? When, when did they really start using sound in movies? I can't remember. I feel like I should, but just trying to make it way more like impressive. But just the idea of like, this has to be one of the first movies that kind of does that. Oh, what's the other one that we saw of the... Uh... Night of the Hunter. Yeah, Night right? Hunter. Like early early on movies where they're just like, we're going to creep you out, you know? And like, and, and whenever you hear certain tunes, you know, a bad guy's are coming. Mm -hmm. I, I just want Jaws to now have like the tweet play when it's coming now. <laughs> I think I think most of the time that I think of that song in the Hall of the Mountain King, I think of I think of it as starting and then getting faster in the next and faster, like dun, 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 like getting faster and faster as you use later on, which is really weird because he sings it so slowly, which makes it way more eerie. Um, yeah. So I wonder if that was on purpose too. Like if that's a, you know, if that song was originally written to progress faster and faster. Um, but man, it is super eerie when he does it slow. And at the very beginning, they don't show his face when he whistles an awful lot. Right. Like they show like his, you know, the shadow the, the on back. the poster. Yeah. Um, or, or just him with his hat from behind. Mm -hmm. And also the, I mean, look at all the, especially trailers you know, in the past like five years, it's like, let's take a song and let's either do it as an aria or a whistle or whatever and make it yeah. like, lower the tempo to make it real creepy. Like for a long time, it, for a while there, it was like, let's get a kid's choir to like uh, sing this creepy version of a song. And it's like, maybe this was the first time where someone's like... <laughs> This this song is, is, is banging. Let's let's take it down a notch. Let's whistle and let's have a you know the the worst kind of evil person ever uh, whistling that. Don't don't bring the kids cry for this movie though. They're gonna he's gonna kill them. <laughs> I, I don't know what's more creepy: his character in the whistle or that damn balloon. Yeah, that, that is a creepy balloon. That is a creepy balloon. I actually like the little balloon, man. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't think he was creepy at all. Well, no, it was, I also think that the song choice is very interesting because I believe that the Hall of the Mountain King is based off of like an old fairy tale about someone who takes children in the night. Oh, really? Uh huh. That's kind of morbid. Isn't that what the Pied Piper story is? Something about coming with the whistle? So, like, Germany has all of these weird, like, fairy tales, which, like, horrible things happen to children. Like, it's baked into their, like, culture to the point where it's just like, guys. They didn't go the Santa Claus route. They're like, we're going to go the Krampus route with all our stories. Guys. <laughs> like, if you even think. Well, no, like, like I, I think that that's, like, actually a bit, like, I don't know something that was like a part of it and why they chose that song and like honestly i think that this is also one of like the best villain reveals because i feel like when you see it's peter lorry like he's so like it's such a weird performance because like he's weird enough looking for you to be like oh yeah obviously <laughs> it's this guy <laughs> I'm sorry. Am I wrong? I'm not. I wanted to. I wanted to talk tonight about is there other actors who are as weird looking as Peter Lurie that you're like every time you see them you're like, oof, man, that's rough. Like I know that's mean, but at the same time, like he does have Daddy, <laughs> that was my first. Danny Trejo, Danny Trejo, no. to, uh, Tommy Dude, Lee. Vincent, Tommy Lee. <laughs> Vincent Scavelli. He was the teacher in uh fast times at ridgemount high like the the science teacher oh. also, he's in ghost yeah his uh, eyes are really black underneath he's the guy on the train in ghost um 
that dude yeah. freaks me out. I was trying to think of people who like may could scare children just by walking into a room and definitely Peter Lurie's one of those people, sadly, you know, like. Well, and it's just like on top of the fact, like, and he wasn't just like a flat villain either. Like it, it, it wasn't like putting Bella Lugosi in Dracula's cape where you're like, okay, it all like makes sense together as a package. Mm-hmm. Whereas like Peter Lorre has like acting chops in this. Yeah, you, you kind of feel awful for maybe feeling bad for a child murderer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's how good he is. He does. Like for a second, you're like, hmm. <laughs> He's the scariest, most terrifying person that I could beat up that I've ever seen. <laughs> I don't think that guy would put up a fight at all, but he's like the most terrifying person that I could beat up, I feel like, in the world. Oh, yeah, no, you would have to take the shower afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> but no, like, there's just like some, like, this performance is just, it blew my mind because it's just like, you can see so many like acting and like movie lineages like how this movie influenced so much you know so i would say that ending right is clearly that monologue is ridiculous it's amazing right it's bananas however there's a scene earlier in the movie where he's looking in a in a glass window and at his own reflection at first and he, then all of a sudden he sees the girl and his hand goes into his mouth and like starts moving like a very awkward way. Like he's overbiting his nails or something. And then he like calms himself down. And then at the very end, boom, right into the hall, the mountain king starts whistling and walks away. And I was like, that guy just had seven emotions in a, in a fucking reflection. Like that's really what happened. He just showed so many emotions in that one little scene. And that is the thing I think that is the best about that. I, that was my favorite part of that. Yeah, uh, uh, right there. That's it. Yeah, he puts his hand um, in his mouth in like this very awkward way I've never seen somebody do before. He just makes so many good acting choices. But but you know who kind of did this recently? Joaquin but Phoenix. again, it's like, is he doing it because of this or a different uh, Joaquin Phoenix in The Joker, right? It's when true. he's like all sad, depressed about and then just kind of like, uh, you know, which that could be anything. But Hey, if this came out in 1931, you can just be like, bitches stealing from, uh, from, yeah. from me, you know? <laughs> well, you know, like I said, like, there's just, like, so many things done in this film that is just such good filmmaking that it's like, of course it's emulated. You know, like, that's, like, how weirdly modern this felt to me. Like, that's what I was trying to say earlier is there's just, like, so many little things that you've seen so many times and you like like if you were like I, I, it just blows me away um does anyone want to talk about anything more specific about the cinematography or like other characters you notice i was gonna say like let's talk about the rest of the ensemble because as much as we like your lori like out of all everyone in this in the cast he's probably the one with the least amount of screen time actually true mm-hmm. Like it's mm-hmm. and there is no real main character other than him. It's the town, you know. Um, yeah. Poor, poor Franz left behind by his crew. <laughs> so he was good. <laughs> yeah, it's so crazy. You know, you see like even the bad, even like the bad guys, like they're mm-hmm. tired of this asshole shit, and they're willing to like put stuff aside. You're like you know, like he's fucking up our business, and like. The cops ain't gonna do shit because you have to go shit by the by the book and whatever. So this film is so morally like ambiguous. Like it, it it makes you think like, oh wait, am I supposed to root for this person, or am I supposed to feel bad for somebody? You know, like so. But I, I really like the extended cast mm-hmm. in this film, even the kids and I and I fucking hate kids. Um, <laughs> if, if, if there was the ending was that they, you know, killed him there, and that was the end. That was the end of the movie. Even if they didn't have as, they wouldn't clearly have as long of a scene. They might do the monologue, but I don't think it would be as long as if he died, right? That I don't think they'd do the part with the lawyer and all that stuff. They would just go right to it. Do you think that would change it for you? Like, I still think either way that they ended it. Like, I wonder why they made the choice to have him get out of there. I think it was to piss. Off. Well, not only that, but like I think that he needed, like the filmmaker needed to show that the community 
is stronger than like his level. Like if they killed him, they would be stooping to his level in like some way. Cause like, yes, you can consider his death justice, but it doesn't bring the children back. And that's it's just it's more violence. Like yeah. he, that's like him taking the easy way out, you know? So like, this is a group of people who like, despite their anger and despite their need for something to be done, like they choose to be the better people. Sure. Well, they, they do. the The police came in. Yeah, the police yeah, came. I think came in just on the nick of time, right. and they looked. Right. So, so that could have been just a riot. True. That could, like, like the police could have like tried to go in there, but they handed the, him, them over, and like they did didn't have to do that. Well, I, I, I think what I'm pretty well, sure they had the numbers to fucking go at go at the cops if they wanted to. Well, I don't know, because everyone, even the, one of the coolest lines of dialogue, which I don't remember, because it's in German, uh, is the the baddie baddie, the, you know, the boss, the, had some... He was like a Nazi, he just seemed like a Nazi. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah, but, uh, I think so. He's Five here, years yeah. later. Indiana Jones. Uh, exactly, that's who it reminded me of. But 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 I'm just saying he had a great line about how he was never caught and all this and that right and uh, I forget the actual interaction because you know subtitles but like him at the end even raises his hand they all are like shit we're caught right because yeah at th that point it's kind of like I guess in this basement there's only one way in and one way out is what I figure. So it's definitely interesting of like, okay, do the police like just carry dude out and then everyone go among your, you know, like we're back at zero guys, thanks for catching him type of thing. Or is the police kind of like power hungry then and like, oh, look at that. We got all these big fishes now, right? And then you have the, the mob kind of be like, fuck this. And in the scuffle between the police and the and the the violent mad mob, Peter gets away again because it felt <laughs> like every time he was like one instance away from from escaping. So uh, yeah, um, the bad all... guy had a cane. You, you're really cool, I think, if you got a cane, regardless. There's an alternate universe where the movie did end like that, and it's just him whistling again at the end credits. <laughs> or all of them whistling, you know, like that song. Um, well, it would be one of those, he takes off his coat that still has the M on the back, and someone uh, else uh, it off, we'll and so that it. other person gets tackled, and is like, was is lost, was dying, he's dying. And he, you know, goes out with, you know, fresh new pair of uh, coat. Um, which that as well is just really, really cool. Just yeah. the idea of like that. I love that in a lot of movies. I love that in a lot of movies. It's kind of redundant, but <laughs> the doing it simple, you know, nowadays there are so many Marvel movies, so many actions, so many, and everything has to be so wild. But when you see older movies, and that's why I like some period movies even more, even if it's kind of like a superhero type of thing, like. Let me see kind of with like uh, a little more ag analog technology. It's just the idea like how are we going to mark this guy so that we can follow him without him knowing. And it's literally just like let's use chalk on a hand and just bump into him and then that's it. And that's so simple yet it was so effective and it took him until a little kid was like Mister, Mister, you have a name and I got it back. Because the little kids were Italian. <laughs> no, I think that was actually pretty spot on. I think German kids and Italian kids. I, I, I could be, I could be ignorant for foreign children, but they sound the same to me. <laughs> but yeah, no, it was like such a clever little device because, like, it's it's smart, but it's not like too smart. Yeah, for sure. It's just it's, a, it's very iconic that that's the only part of the movie, like. That hand is on the poster. Mm -hmm. That hand is the first thing that we see in the film for the title card. Like yeah. it's, it's a good, it's a, it's a, they knew what they were doing. It's a good shot. Yeah, it's a really good shot. But Dude, like, this, go ahead, sorry. No, no, no. Like you go ahead, say what you were gonna say. Cause I was, I was gonna say, if this movie was made forty years later, 
it still would seem like there's something about it when you watch it. Like if you were watching it, then you were immediately like, this is the best thing I've ever seen. Like that last reveal scene, I can't imagine in a movie there was anything like that ever where you're like, just like, boom, blown away like that. At that time, which no. which, which last reveal you the, mean? Like when he turns around and sees all the people in there. Yes, yes. Like that. That, that is that like is, iconically one of the greatest scenes I've ever seen. Like, mm -hmm. especially for when it was like that long ago that he decided to do it that way is unbelievable. That that was the cast waiting for the lead to show up to the ten o'clock call <laughs> time, and they showed up at eleven. <laughs> They didn't pay them. They, they <laughs> just that wasn't active. That man actually died that day. I thought Peter Lorre was the accountant. They brought him downstairs. <laughs> you despise me, don't you? Oh, I'm trying to think of like what else. Like so, I go ahead. This, like I loved how they showed the violence in this too. You know, like you just like the ball rolling or like the little balloon and the power lines. Like there's just because like I feel like that's like something that we don't have as much nowadays where like it cuts to like you always have to see it happen. And like there's just something that much worse not seeing the final result. Right. You know? I mean. Well, it goes even back to Jaws, right? And the fact that the the animatronic shark, that it was such a, a, a shit show that they ended up cutting out having the actual shark in the majority of the film. And it just built the tension so much more and was way more effective because it was just the music, bon -um, bon -um, which again, right? Like use other senses to create a thing and this movie was doing that back then already and it's just uh, very interesting how you don't see someone but you're already it's already terrifying right or every time at least for me when you would see someone's back just kind of walking i'd be like oh my god oh my god that's him that's him right because you you just don't know you, you're just not sure if it's gonna be or not be him yeah, no, like, that's what I was going to bring up. It's just, I also thought it was really interesting because, like, well, me and Chris were talking about this earlier. I watch a lot of true crime stuff, and it's just, like, so much of, like, the actual tropes, like, the fact that this was, like, a lot earlier than I thought it was, you know, like, the fact that this is, like, such, like, these are stories and monsters that are so ingrained still to the point where we actually do know how to recognize these individuals even back then. You know, like it follows like those patterns that like we would call tropes, but like human behavior as a trope, you know? Right. They were doing like psychological breakdowns on his personality. A hundred percent. They were, they actually used those words. Like that was crazy. I never thought that they did that back then. So just look and, and, and sound basically, yeah, we're kind of right between 1926 and 1930 is when they really started transitioning into using so like this is early on with the actual you know usage of of uh recording in uh and some of the recording some of the sound and yeah there's a, probably a lot of studio like that's really crisp there's shit watching from the 70s and i'm like the sound in this is terrible right but uh you know those germans and their uh you know, way of doing things. Yeah, there was a point in the film that I thought somehow they fucked it up. It, uh, right right before the first police raid on like the speakeasy, where it's just completely dead quiet. I was like, oh, come on, like, did the audio go out? And then all of a sudden, as soon as you see the cops, the city's alive, like, the cops are here! The fucking cops are here! <laughs> they did that numerous times, man. There were scenes where, like, cars were driving by, and there was no sound at all for a couple seconds. I noticed that, too. There were multiple times that they did that in the movie. I don't know if it yeah. was, like, they didn't have the sound for it at the time, or... But, yeah, they, they, they lost They lost the, the, the right to using the music, so they couldn't upload it. <laughs> No, I, I think 
I was thinking of that because you didn't even have like sound of cars or anything. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. It just felt like I don't feel like it was a choice. I think it was just you didn't think of it, right? Like I think it was the capturing of sound anyway of that maybe was more complicated than you know to to be like okay let's get the car let's get the this like let's get the that so i think it was maybe a practice that wasn't really incorporated yet hmm. well either way like it's just that astounds me that this was 31 because like i could have swore i saw 38 and like like i said it's just like there's just so many things in this that just feel very of the time. And I don't I don't know if that's just like how awful things are right now. <laughs> <laughs> or like if, if, it, if that's just how like storytelling is. Like you'll you'll stumble upon something and you're just like, no way. And then you go back farther and like farther and farther and see how these things are still very relevant. You know? So uh, uh, yeah, I, I, another, we, so we were talking about sound and a little bit about kind of like cin cinematography and shots, but they had some great shots of just like the stairwells and mm -hmm. just like the way they would frame shots of like doorways with what was further down and every time they could show, like it really showed the, the grandiose of it or whatever, because you would see like, they even had the like the it was a, a, a like a crane or whatever from outside going into the window going into the window going into and you're like oh shit are they gonna do a whatever but I don't know if you guys noticed really quick like the glass like a, a glass Moved. pane open as yeah. it went through but I was like that's pretty freaking smooth like even that like was very nicely done. This the scene where he's looking at his reflection that I was talking about, where he puts his hand in his mouth. He was outside of like a joke shop or something with this arrow bouncing, yeah. and there was like a spiral that was spinning that would like yeah. mesmerize you. And I was just like, "There's so many good things in this scene in the in the scenery, dude." When he went to the next store and is walking by it, it was like glass display windows that had these like lamps coming off the wall outside yeah. and shining back into the store. And I, there were like 10 of them. And I was like, this is unbelievable. Is this what Germany was like then? Because like this, the architecture and all is beautiful all throughout. So that those scenes too, man, I agree with you 100%. The, the cinematography and like the scenery was unreal. You know, they did such a good job making the neighborhood itself come alive, too. Mm -hmm. You know, they were very good about making you feel like you belonged there. Yeah. It was it was like a it felt like a blue collar neighborhood that like where justice was supposed to reign. And like, yes, there would be bad guys and good guys, but there were still some rules that you kind of followed. Like they definitely established that. Um, so part part. Uh, since he brought that up of, of rules to be followed and all that you know and clearly we talked a little bit about you know what happened later with the Nazis and all that but yeah the police was very much just like let's bust in and let's create chaos and round, round, round people up and we don't fucking care whereas the, the thieves and stuff like information is key like we need information we need eyes open and and just everyone focus, you know. Whereas the police was just like, "Oh, we're gonna fucking break everything down until we find this guy," um, and 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 that's a very interesting. Like, wait, so like the the bad guys have a slightly better idea of how you can do it without creating chaos. Which is just like eyes and ears everywhere, you know? Yeah. And I thought it was really clever that the guy who ends up ratting out our, our, our poor main, it was the blind dude. Mm -hmm. So like they gave they gave him a purpose, like, oh, it wasn't just some bad sap selling balloons. Well, because then they had the other people that were pretending to be blind and had the dog and then like raised the glasses and I was like, eh. Um yeah. Like, I was on the edge of my seat when the blind man is like, did you see the man that was whistling? Did you see him? And the guy's like, yeah. no, I don't see him. I'm like, please see him. Start running, dude. Just go down. <laughs> Whoever's whistling. The tension of that was yeah. just, like, such a great buildup.
And I thought maybe that was going to be it, right? But then again, when there's that reveal of all the people and it's like, oh, you don't know it's me. And then the blind guy like comes up or like Puffy like, remember? And I was like, man, blind dude even remember what balloon it was. It was a creepy dude balloon. Yeah, like, it was a creepy balloon. That thing freaked me out. <laughs> I still really like the balloon. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but... For your birthday. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> I, I really did like the shot of like right when Pierre Laurie's character realizes that he's basically caught. He's straight, he looks dead at the fucking camera. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> just noise. And they're all in the corner. They're all the beggars are in every corner of the street. There's literally nowhere he can go. And it's like, damn, you're fucked. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes yeah. into the building, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that wow. whole building, and then it's just I don't know, there's so many layers to it. Because then it's like we have him. Oh, what building is it? Oh, they have money. Well, hey, two birds, one stone. Let's mm-hmm. just go in and try to rob shit. And I guess if they would have just focused on finding him and not try to rob it, poor what's his face would have gotten wouldn't have gotten left behind, and then they would have been able to like taking care of business. <laughs> But man, the scene in the attic of that building too. Like he had on another really good monologue there too. Mm-hmm. Do you remember the With- cops are like these idiots tried to rob this building? This is the worst robbery I've ever seen. It left everything. No, wait, yeah. what did he do? Like they took nothing. They took a man. <laughs> yeah, I mean that the way they built tension was so great because you're like he's in that room. He's in the room and he's using his knife to try to get out the screws and try to undo everything. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, that. it was really well done on how they played with tension, raising that, lowering that, raising that, lowering that. Um, yeah. It's so many times in, in movies, like over the top, people do this or go like this and use their eyes. And like th- at no point that I feel like laughing anytime I saw him use his eyes in a way that now when I see it, I feel like people overact. Mm-hmm. For me, when he turned his face real slow and those eyes were looking like I never felt, com- you know what I mean? Like it is a trope that people like overdo like, oh, you know, and he, when he was doing it, I genuinely felt fear for him. Um Sadly, you know, as that character he is, but uh, I genuinely felt that. I never thought it was comedic at all, but I think it is used now comedically. No, like, well, or do you the Looney Tune guys? Because that, that's where that came from. Is they they copied Peter Lore's reactions, <laughs> and were one of the characters. So, like, again, like that's just like why this is like such a really wonderful little piece of cinema. Because like you can literally like talk to any filmmaker, and you'll find this somewhere. And they're like, yeah, no, I watched this once and like, I totally played with this. You know, like, it, it's it's a really kind of fun, cool little piece of cinema history. I really like it. Yeah. The, um... Yeah, I want to save it till my final thought, but honestly, I think if you said pick a movie pre-1955 even... And say that anyone who watched you were going to say, like, give me one movie pre-1955 that you would recommend right now. I've never seen a classic movie. I think this would be in my top. It might be the one that I would pick. I think that's a person might like. Pre-what, you said? Pre-what? Like, 1955. You know how, like, the golden age, you know, like, I I think that this might be the one that I would try and hook them into the genre or, you know, the time period. I Um, I would, when you, maybe when you said genre, because I'd be like. There's got to be a yet. Chaplin or a Buster Keaton, at least for my sensibility, right? Would be That's your the, number one choice to like, right? Like, okay. I'm, I would maybe lean towards Chaplin or Buster Keaton or Akira Kurosawa, right? All those. But if sure. you're like a horror or a thriller, like then I can see this one. But yeah, for me, I have other ones that. Just kind of what maybe that says more about me. Enjoy. Huh? <laughs> I like the one with the serial killer and <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Oh no. Was that out loud? Yep. You just really like movies about, you know, serial killers that put children in games. <laughs> I was like, he's gonna go there. Right. <laughs> You're a teacher, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm, I'm just glad that the kids in this movie didn't piss me off. <laughs> They didn't last long enough. They didn't. <laughs> <laughs> also, like, wait, let's be real. We're, we're kind of asking for it. So, like, them singing about the guy. It's like, yeah. like, watch out for the man in black. He's going to get you. And he's still getting people. You know, that would be like singing about Jeffrey Dahmer while he's eating people. Like, <laughs> that's weird. That is weird. Like, um, I'm not like what it was like in the dark ages. There was always that one asshole pretending to be a werewolf and kill people. I'm so, sure he buys about so, the werewolf. So it's, there's this, you know, so three people are credited for as, as writing, and one is Egon Jack, Jacobson for an article, and so I was looking, and it's supposedly based on serial killer uh, Peter Curtin, the vampire of Dusseldorf. Uh -huh. like, who I guess uh, his crimes took place in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. That's messed up. That and we had one too. His name was Albert Fish. So um, that was pretty close in time to when it was made. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, at least 10 years. That's... That makes that, that pants. I, I guess it depends how long he was doing his shenanigans for versus, you know. Sexist. Like, this artist was able to look at that group of crimes and apply it to, like, children, like, stories. Because, like, that's, like, another thing that I thought was very interesting is how very, like, fairy tale like a lot. Of, like, yeah. since, like, photography and, like, the lighting of it was so harsh, there's, like, almost this very surreal quality that makes it feel like, like uh, like a, a campfire story, you know? I think that's right from the beginning to that first scene where the mom, or I don't know if it's the first scene where the mom is like upstairs, like cleaning in her house. That was like the coldest apartment and like the outside with the stairs, that was so like not warming in any way, shape or form. And she goes to the balcony while they're singing outside. I agree with you a hundred percent. Like it is, it definitely feels that way. And, and you're kind of just hoping that, oh, it wasn't her kid. It wasn't that kid. Right. <laughs> and meanwhile, like, you know, this is kind of happening and you're not freaking out. Like, who's letting her kid walk home alone at that point? I don't know. She, th she thought that she was with the friends. So I'm guessing she was hoping that as long as she's with her friends, she should be fine. Well, like, and I think that's like another like kind of statement on like what it's like, like a class statement where it's like yeah. these are people who are poor because like they can't take their kids to and from school. She's a laundress, yeah, yeah. you know, so like she has to work and like, you know, she's old yeah. enough to know the way and there's usually a lot of people like, like, like that's smart. Like, Mm -hmm. And With that's also like another like kind of weird aspect to this too is like just how normal yeah. everything was. And was that was it the, the mom that was one of the mourners at the trial at yes. the end of the movie? Mm -hmm. she, she was the one that says that that this isn't gonna bring the children back. Yes. Which is crazy. We see the ending of this fake trial with the citizens, which is as real as it gets, and we just and the movie ends. With this real legit trial just barely starting, but yeah. but then he has his his lawyer who actually starts kind of defending him. Like he's got a disease, like you guys, and everyone's like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa!" But like that was wild because it's like he can't help himself, and and that's where I was like, "Okay, filmmakers, what are you trying? Like you better not say." that uh pedophilia and murder is okay if you can't help yourself like this better <laughs> not be the message that you're saying that it's you know someone raping and killing kids is the same as someone stealing watches because you just can't help yourself and i'm i'm glad i didn't go there but i was worried for a little a little bit dude the most um, good oh and no, i also go, thought go. that the guy who played the lawyer in the kangaroo cart like the guy who's just like, yeah, I don't want to fucking be here either. But I'm, a, I'm good at my job. <laughs> like, <laughs> and, and at least he was real with them too. It's like, it's like, hey, like you gotta shut the fuck up. It doesn't look good. <laughs> but, but then he got into it. He's like, oh man, I'm the. He's like, I'm gonna defend him. You know, uh, Atticus Finch 
hold my beer. Yeah. Let me show you how a real, you know, like lawyer. Oh man, I, I didn't wild. see that. Um, what, 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 you, what you might call it? Um, four-eyed nerd in the <laughs> south take notes. My man took notes. <laughs> 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 He was just like, okay, fine. You give me the crappy job. I'm going to make it a job. <laughs> you are Take going to have to work. It's not just going to be me. Um, the, the most psychotic thing that Peter Lorre does in the whole movie is when he's having that speech and he turns and he's like, yeah, well, you guys stealing stuff. That's, and all I did was kill some kids. Like, basically, he's where he's headed with that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> Like, His not amazing. I don't know why, but my mind went to Bill Burr saying that. Like, <laughs> you guys just were stealing shit, and I'm just here doing my thing. How am I worse? That's Bill Burr, yeah. Well, um, what, what, uh, what was I going to say? Uh, in my personal opinion, I think actually the most psychotic thing that Peter Lorre does is buy a cognac and not drink it. <laughs> He did. did. He not drink it? I don't yeah. remember. It was behind like the fence where you could kind of see him when he sat uh, down. The um, the other thing, we don't like. Uh, someone brought it up. We don't really know much about him, right? I mean, they do find his apartment and all that, but they don't really get that much information from the uh, housekeeper, not how the landlady, I think. Right. Um. So it's really interesting, also, seeing that from like this bad guy this horrible person and it's almost like it's not about him and that's a very interesting way to see where uh movies or shows or plays or whatever where because it, it creates a bigger lore it, it it creates him even more of this mythical kind of uh, uh character that you don't know much about him but he's the boogeyman right the the idea of like there really isn't much to know other than he's fucking pure evil, basically. Yeah. I wonder if the cops ever told the landlady the truth because they were in that room multiple <laughs> times. <laughs> no, they never left. They never left. There were two dudes that stayed there. And were really like, they never left. They're still there till to, to this day. They're still there waiting for. Their skeleton is in a chair. Like, they are they are two very happy great 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 to be mamas. Yeah, they're just like, man. I wonder he hasn't showed up yet. I hope Bob calls <laughs> us. Maybe they'll relieve us soon. Like, <laughs> they hear sirens and all that, and it's like, huh? Oh look, people are running towards that old factory. Well, I wonder what that's about. So we gotta wait here. <laughs> it was pretty rough. That part, that's this, film, this film's got everything. It's got a, a, but, a, a horror, got a mystery, and a heist in one Pete, movie. It is. Peter Lurie needs to buy a bird so the bird can tell him that people are in his place. There you <laughs> go. Uh, <laughs> call back. All right. Your feathers um, are my friend, what is wrong? <laughs> oh no! But, but real quick, this is uh, what is it? Peter Lang is that the the filmmaker, the director? Uh, uh, Fritz Lang. Fritz Lang. Yeah. His first uh, sound movie. This is his first sound movie. This is how he kills it. Yeah. Ugh. He said, "I guess this is his magnus opus," and I was like. Is it Pretty darn. Uh... This is the one he considers his Magnus Opus. Yeah. Okay. No, that's fine. That, those are his movies. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you say? Nothing. Nothing. I, I I'm glad that he thinks this one's better than you know the one. Who cares? Who gives a shit? Let's. <laughs> I, I'm, they're both good movies, but like. That's what a... like a nerd. <laughs> What's his other movie then? What's the other? I'm confused. Maybe he has an opinion about something. I'm very interested. No, because like, he, he also made Metropolis. So like, and and he considers M to be his magnum opus. Is like, okay, that's fine. Uh, he puts the M in Magnus opus. 
Oh. And they both started with them too. What? <laughs> it's all coming around, guys. I'm sensing a pattern. But well, that's why Magnum has two M's. So he puts with his two movies, he puts the M's in Magnum, 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 <laughs> Magnum. Oh. <laughs> we did comedy. <laughs> Made a joke. <laughs> Did it, guys? God damn it! <laughs> <laughs> so oh. oh god! I need to laugh after watching that. It is, it that is deep, man. It's a deep movie. It is that, like it's an emotional ride from 1931. That's crazy. Like that, it's that emotional. It really is. We've watched some messed up films in our. <laughs> And when this was starting, I was like, oh, no, not again. No, 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 Guys, I have to... again. I'm quitting what? this group. I'm going to quit this group. Yeah. But I'm like, but Peter Lorre wouldn't do this to me. He, right. he wouldn't. He would, he, he, he's going to make it okay. And, uh, yeah, the ending. Yeah, if they would have made it to where... Where they, I, I thought they were going to go with, uh, you guys all have a sickness too, because you can. And they're like, okay. I would have been like, I'm done. Oh, <laughs> but luckily they didn't, they didn't go that route. Just think like Peter Lurie could have saved like Dear Zachary. He could have been in like those kind of movies too. And like, because Rich. Oh my. Just gaslighting <laughs> the whole audience. <laughs> now, you know what? You. you Although I will say Peter Lorre probably could improve every single movie we saw, including Havoc. If Peter Lorre was one of the gangbangers, I'm sure that movie would be uh, 10 times better. My friends, we're just so fucking bored. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. That's going to be my new TikTok channel, guys. <laughs> Peter Lorre in... Movie. <laughs> I need yeah. the word. <laughs> Anyways, so uh, should we just uh, do final thoughts? Sure, I think so. I think so. All right, so I guess um, I'll start. I am so glad that I watched this movie. I think it has so many links to a lot of like stuff that we consider really good cinema today. Like it was ahead of its time, a hundred percent. And if you're a cinephile, like this should definitely be on your list. I also go on the same screen. Um, the next film we review, I should have known it's um, a black and white movie with a serial killer who hates children. And I want that movie to be awful so it could break this chain. <laughs> hey, this movie is, yeah, it's pretty bomb. It's a really great film. And, uh, I, I pretty much recommend to anybody who's into movies. Definitely not, not the kids. Don't don't bring the kids. <laughs> the kids could watch the Night of the Hunter. I think the kids will be fine with that one. It's a Christmas movie, but leave, leave the kids at home for this one. <laughs> they don't see anything. Unless you want to put a little German fear into them, you know, like. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Like... Um. I'll go next. Uh, for me, this is a classic I never want to see remade. You know, there's certain things that you're like, don't even ever try and touch that. Um, I don't know of another actor that I could see playing this role in this kind of way. Uh, I know Kevin Spacey's now like kind of, eh, um, but I feel like he had a, that seven role was kind of like a weird role that I think would be really difficult for other people to uh, take over. You know, like that there's certain roles with actors, but this one to me, like you could not replace him in this movie and have anything close to, especially with the acting chops. This is his breakthrough movie. That's insane. Um, Apparently he got typecast in some ways after that with the Mr. Moto and all that. But um, to me, that's sad because I think this dude has tons of range as an actor. I would recommend this to anybody, I, like I said before, who has not watched a lot of classic movies because I think it's one that would make people try out different things. And it has a lot. It makes you look at things in the movie a lot. So I think when, as you saw other movies, you would start to notice things in the background that you never caught before the way the, you know, the cinematography and things like that. It was a great pick, Michaela. I loved it. All right. All right, I'll go. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't know what I, to expect going into this. 
and I really enjoyed it. It was really messed up. It's it's great to see how well movies have aged and compared to other ones, right? Like this movie from 31 is way better in so many ways than a lot of more recent movies in just storytelling, camera shots, stuff like that for what they had back then in 31. Uh, this is one of the first like procedurals, right? Like this is just like, so yeah, I would recommend this to people that are into, you know, the crime dramas, NYPD, like whatever. It's just like, you want to see kind of where it started all? You want to see what SVU victims, like you truly want to see like a tour de force type of thing? Like check this out. Um, I would love to watch this at a like at a cinema, like one of those like old uh, places, maybe the Vista or me- maybe uh, New Beverly. You know, Tarantino. I know he watches our our little review channel right here, so maybe <laughs> if, Get us in. if you're watching, put it in New Beverly or the Vista because he bought that as well. So I w- yeah I. W- and, and yeah, with an audience, I feel it would be just another complete level of of of, of tension. So I I enjoyed it. I, I and it's crazy because I don't like you know the subject matter, or I don't think anyone really does. But it's like I hate when I like something that deals with this kind of shit so much, right? That I'm just like it's so well done. I shouldn't like this. Same thing with the other one. What is what was the other one of the uh, you guys were bringing the Maltese. No, not the Maltese Falcon. The the other one of the guy that kept was looking for the money that was in the oh, dog. Night of the Hunter. Uh, Na- Night of the Hunter. Night of the yeah. Hunter. Night yeah. of the Hunter. I do. I want to watch that now. I know we have talked about it a couple times. Oh yeah. So if you like this movie, check out Night of the Hunter, man. It's gonna change your life. Um. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Maybe there's like a gas leak or something in the house. But I'm having, I'm having what? I'm way too giddy all of a sudden for for the subject matter. Uh, on that note, possible. that's my Anything that's my final thought. <laughs> all right. Okay, so um, that is it for tonight. Um, does anyone have a question for someone who's not here? Yeah, anyone? I oh, can set... Steve, we ain't got first next week. Next I week. You... Uh, uh, I don't know why you're asking me because I'm not in the, 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 the cinema club right now. So, uh, Dino, you answer uh, yes. <laughs> that is correct, Steve, because it's my turn to big next week's movie. And that movie is gonna be R R R two. I like the movie so much that I'm I'm doing it again. <laughs> no, I kid, I kid. I'm picking Bardo. It Ooh. is on Netflix. It is uh, Inyaritu. So I I gotta I gotta go with my. Uh, one Mexican director to the other Mexican director because the last one I picked was uh, yeah, Pinocchio, and so now I'm picking a bardo. And yeah, so for Oye Dimelo Cinema Club, my name is Dino. We have El Profesor, we have a couple of them. Catch us next week. Uh, goodbye.